Well, thank you all. <clears throat> so I'm going to kind of um, beam out a little bit and we're going to look at some macro uh, parameters. And obviously climate change, Terry's been talking about temperature, but there's also the issue of ocean acidification. But what I'm going to do is come back a full circle and, and we're going to look at how these two processes in a macro sense affect what are the basic thing of corals is how they calcify and, um, and uh, which is, you know, how they interact and, and which is now the most significant problem uh, for corals. So Terry's paper, um, which has pointed out the effects of bleaching um, and, uh, uh, <coughs> and at last night's symposium, um, Verena pointed out that even the most rugged corals we can find on our planet, which happen to exist in the Kimberley, uh, even those corals can be vulnerable to um, thermal stress or unusually warm temperatures, although there are some that perhaps uh, are even tougher than we, we initially thought. Um, but why are corals so vulnerable to thermal stress? Um, that's what I'll talk about. But the, the reason I'm doing that is not by plan, it's sort of by accident. <coughs> I shouldn't say that directly, but the, the, most of this research was focused on looking at the effects of ocean acidification using geochemical uh, proxies or traces to see how the progress of this um, process of acidification was, you know, how it was affecting our oceans and our coral reefs. And the reason for this is pretty obvious, and it's shown in this diagram. <clears throat> I think it's a 19, this happens to be an updated 213, but it's been, this sort of diagram has been around for some time. You can see the shift in saturation state of the oceans from around four down to um, less than three as the PCO2 of the atmosphere is increasing. And, and this, for a lot of um, uh, workers in the field, was a, a, a lot of concern because the, we, know, we know that the calcification rate G is directly, or has a strong relationship to the saturation state. And the idea was, well, if you're, you know, we're going from four down to three, then this difference is, you know, when we get to one, they won't be there at all. And we're going to have, since it's a power term, these are temperature dependent that the calcification rates will be dramatically affected as the, ocean, as the oceans acidify. And this has been the prevailing view for up to about five, five years ago. And um, uh, we've, we and other researchers started to look at it uh, more directly as how it would influence corals. So the initial view was this is what's happening in the seawater and the coral calcification process will directly be dependent. But we know, of course... Um, that there's, the corals are a much more complex organism and what's really of, at issue is what, how does the calcifying fluid itself from which corals precipitate the skeleton, how is it responding to the external, it changes in external uh, seawater? And so we know that there's various processes that can affect the internal pH. We have calcium ATPases where you can exchange calcium with hydrogen ions and the coral can manipulate its own pH. And this work, we've, we, we've, been, we've mostly done most of this about five years ago. Um, we understand, we're, we're still working on it. Um, and we had some, you know, we used data from fixed experiments I'll show you in a moment. The other, the other part we never really knew what, how to deal with was the supply of DIC, i.e. Um, carbon itself. How does that um, get into the calcifying flu fluid? We know there's a direct seawater pathway, so some of the, the DIC is the total dissolved in organic carbon, if you like. That the calcium, you know, that you ultimately make the um, calcium carbonate, and um, we know, for example, you've, we've heard a lot about the zoos and thalle that they're probably sources of CO2. There's diffusional pathways and so on. We don't know of any bicarbonate iron pump. I mean, bicarbonate, as I'll show you, is the dominant seawater species. Um, so we've we've been a little uncertain about what the total um, DIC is, but and I'll show you now. We have, we've got we've now figured out how to get that parameter so we can now constrain the full carbonate system from which at the calcifying fluid and therefore potentially look at what's been happening. So the, um, the proxy we mostly use is this boron proxy and boron has this uh, speciation between borate and boric acid and you can see it's very similar to the speciation of carbonate and bicarbonate iron that's in seawater. And so these two red curves and it turns out when you make calcium carbonate, ultimately you have to, there's a carbonate iron, that's, that, that's the main ingredient, obviously, to add to the calcium to make calcium carbonate. I'll show you, we, I won't go spend much time on the boron isotope, that's, you should know, but we've, using just simple, uh, relate, well, not simple, but uh, relationships between what you measure the boron calcium in, in the skeleton and what we 
um, can model is think of being in the fluid, and once you know the KD and its relationship, you can in fact therefore get the carbonate ion of the calcifying fluid, and once you know the pH, you can get, get the DIC. So I'm sorry to be too technical, but these, these are basic parameters that um, um, determine the, um, you know, how calcification occurs. And then, of course, once we have this, we're, using, we're getting it, remember, retrospectively from the skeleton. We can figure out the relationships between the pH, DIC, and this ultimate parameter, which is the saturation state of the calcifying fluid. And then we can ask the question, how is that related to seawater saturation state? And how do these change over time? So we can... Just briefly with the um, pH, I'll show you, because I'll be using this. Um, we, we again use the same system and we're using, and because corals take up borate, we use this fractionation factor and the isotope change along here to get the um, seawater, or the pH of which they calcify. And, we, and use it, but this is a 212 paper. We showed that, um, that the calcifying fluid pH seemed to have a relationship, a strong relationship to the seawater pH, but and this line here shows the change in seawater pH, and it seemed to have a slope of about a third to a half, though, so that the corals seem to be sensing about a third to a half the change in the seawater pH. And that was quite a, a big deal in, at the time because it showed they were partially connected to the seawater environment in terms of pH, and therefore would be partially sensing these changes in ocean acidification, and even allowing for that partial kind of uh, sensing, if you like, for the external environment, that, that was significant but wasn't anywhere near as dramatic as what people before had suggested. So we were already t saying that acid ocean acidification is still there, still significant, but nowhere near, it's not going to be as detrimental as, as, or catastrophic um, as people were thinking. And I should point out now that these, all these data came from static aquarium experiments where obviously people fixed the pH of seawater to see what the response would be. Because if you want to look at a parameter, the typical way to do it, you've got to fix it, make fixed step changes and see how things respond. And this is not the real world. We know, as I'll show you in the next slide, that um, what you have to understand is what's actually happening in, in the real world with not only pH changes, but temperature changes, light changes, nutrient changes, and parameters interact. And so although it's nice to have these conceptual experiments where you'll understand one experiment, you have to be... In your mind, you have to think, well, is this really what, how the real world's operating? Is this really how corals operate? So being in the centre, we have a lot of access to... We have access to all the reefs across the country. Davies Reef, which has been monitored by Ames. Um, we worked up in Coral Bay a lot. And, we've, and, and actually down in Perth, we are offshore, we have Rotterdam Island where one of our students, Claire Ross, works. Um, and there's corals now living along here and there's a ferry every day. So we can go out, or she goes out, I should say, when necessary, and can sample it. So we actually have, first off, we've constrained the physical seawater conditions. And this shows work of a former um, Jim Falter, who was a former a member of the centre. He's now gone back to the States, where we've figured out the pH changes. We've monitored it. And we've done this for, for these regions. I should say Ames have done it for us at Ames. But we've been able to extend it back in time to understand just how the seawater is changing in terms of these parameters. So we know what the ambient ocean is doing. And we get our parietes and we do our geochemical measurements. So, so just to, to show you, this is, I'm just using the Davies Reef as an example. Um, we're going back, we've got about five or six years here. We can go back as long as you like. Um, and the blue shows the seawater pH and, this, and the red shows the ocean temperatures of that particular reef. I should point out, so the you can see already that the seasonal cycle that in ocean acidification is about the full shift uh, that the oceans have seen already. About a tenth of a pH unit is what has happened uh, over, since over the Anthropocene so far. And you can see that within a reef that occurs every year from summer to winter. So that already gives you a hint that corals may be better adapted than what we um, give them credit, or had given them credit for. Now, using our models from the aquaria, this is what we predicted that the um, calcifying fluid should be. Remember, I said about a slope of about a half, but they do elevate. I forgot to point out in that previous slide that corals elevate the pH, and you can see this elevation of about um, 0.4 of a pH unit. So they elevate it above uh, seawater, and obviously they do that to drive the e equilibria from up in, higher up into the carbonate space. Remember that carbonate, that red line, as you increase the pH, the more carbonate iron relative bicarbonate you, 
be produced, and this is the way they could increase their saturation state to enhance calcification. This is my basic thoughts. And we've done the measurements now on the corals for the pH, and lo and behold, it's the, about the right magnitude actually in the wintertime. These, these lines are summer. Um, but you notice that the amplitude is um, about almost an order of magnitude larger. Uh, the phasing turns out to be similar, but the amplitude is much larger. And in summertime, the pH is decreased. And why would that be? Why would coral... So this is obviously a biologic... The corals are manipulating their internal pH on a seasonal basis, even much larger than the, the uh, seawater variation. Why would they do this? Um, well, we've got our magical other parameter now, the boron calcium, so we can actually get the DIC, um, which is the other part of the equation needed to get the full carbonate parameters. And you can see that the DIC is actually out of phase. So the DIC is oscillating, so its maximum in, is in summer. So the DIC is, <coughs> the way I've expressed it, is relative to seawater. You can see it's about two to three times seawater. So the model is that corals get some of their DIC from seawater, and they're getting it, obviously, from some other source, most likely the zooxanthellae or the symbionts of them. People have previously identified as the most likely source. And the fact that it's much higher in summer is totally consistent with such a view. Um, <clears throat> and we'll, let's pursue that. And if you look at the relationship between the DIC enrichment and the pH, you see it's, this is an incredibly strong linear control. You know, this relationship... Is, is um, and the different colours show the different um, uh, parietes. Colors. So the blue are from exactly the same reef, Davies Reef, and these others, the red and the orange, are from um, Coral Bay, living 10, 20 metres apart. So it's not a seawater variation. It's these guys have slightly different biologic uh, controls. Um, and my view about this is that in the summertime, this, so this down here is the highest DIC in the summer. So this is when the zooxanthellae are actively producing a lot more CO2 and thereby um, um, transferring and making it available as uh, DIC in the calcifying fluid. And the coral is manipulating the pH to kind of keep control of this supply of DIC, which is coming from its symbiont. So the pH is like an accelerator the coral has via the calcium ATPases, which can easily... Um, keep things under control, um, and why does it, you know, why does it do that? Um, so I'm saying here's the winter. Um, this is the where the maximum control is. You can see, by the way, this is these are huge shifts, right? These are 0.3 pH units. So the corals really got a strong control over the pH. <coughs> and why does it do this? Well, you plot it versus temperature, and you see that there's again an incredibly narrow range of saturation states, but elevated. So the saturation states range from 15 to 20, and here's the seawater down here about a bit less than 4 or 3 point something. So the corals are elevating their saturation state. Why, of course? Well, that's, that's the basic parameter that controls calcification. So if you want to control how you grow, that's the one you've got to control, right? So, and they do that over very narrow ranges, and it depends on individuals, how well they grow, right? So individuals may have different proportions of zooxanthellae or may have different efficiencies or densities and their ultimate driver is to get control that parameter so they can control their growth and other organic functions like any human or living organism has to basically control how it grows and corals are no different. And you can look at, you know, another way to look at this is look at the, um, <clears throat> the growth rate G. This is what, it still has a strong seasonal control because the temp or fluctuation because it it's higher omega in summer, I didn't say that. And if you said there was no control, this would be the dash lines, right? So they'd be growing about factors of two or three times greater. I have to speed up. <laughs> and the student, uh, Claire Ross, has done the same in, um, in Rottnest Island, and the same systematics occur. That is high pH in winter, uh, low in summer, and so on. Now the question is, sorry, I'm going to have to be a little patient. <coughs> What happens when you stress a coral, right? <laughs> so what happens when they get bleached, right? So what's, well, what's all this? So we can look at this now. So here's a coral that had, we've looked at one, Pablo's done this work, a postdoc in, in our centre, and it's looked at different part tracks close to a bre the 98 bleaching event. 
And what we find is that the, all these parameters stay the same, except they lose their seasonality. This is the pH, this is the DIC, um, and the um, saturation state. But the growth rates drop, right? So even when they're stressed out, they, don't, they can't escape the fact that the calcifier, they have to have a threshold saturation state to produce their skeleton. And all that happens is the rate of that they can do it at stops, reduces. So the, the calcification rate d decreases, but they still have to get to this saturation state to calcify. So they still, you know, that's like it's like a condition they can't escape from. You know, although they're getting stressed out, they can't calcify at a lower saturation state. Somehow, you know, they have to do it at the same critical threshold state. And we've done this for all species of corals, this relationship. You see deep sea ones, of course, without zoos and thallae, um, operate closer to one. Um, and in a sense, you might therefore argue that this is kind of a sensitivity, you know, how much you can... Um, uh, the, the DIC range in, is, in the essence, the biologic component from the zoos and thallae um, gives you that control, whereas the... As you get closer to one, you're getting closer to the pure seawater azosanthellate response, if you like. So, in a sense, this you could also see this as a response curve. So that's so. This is now the end of my talk. <laughs> so they upregulate and control. I'll use the word control the saturation state of the calcifying fluid, and pH is the the coral's mechanism of doing it. So the good news is here: ocean acidification, at the moment, is not really in the. You know, corals have a major, very strong. Um, ability to control this, I, I showed you. They can, they're already uh, ma manipulating their pH out of factors that are th we won't see anything like it for many hundreds of years. But not to say it won't ultimately become, if you actually get things start to dissolve, that's another problem. Um, and they're doing it because they can't, the, the thing that they can't control is the DIC coming from the symbionts. So they've had, they have this symbiosis, but they could never... It looks like they, they've not been able to actually control what the symbionts do directly, so they do it indirectly in the calcifying fluid by adjusting the pH to, to, mat, to keep up with the supply coming from the symbionts so they can keep their growth rate, which they have to control under... under you know, that they can keep that so-called controlled again. Um, and pH is independent of seawater. Bleaching, so the, the Achilles heel, therefore, is obviously what happens when um, they lose the symbionts, right? And I'm going back to basic first year biology. You lose your symbionts, you lose your supply of energy, and therefore they stop calcifying. That's, that's, their, um, that's the demise of corals. And so their Achilles heel is, is really the abrupt warming, and we've seen that, of course, in Terry's work. This is what we're worrying about. And that's the problem. And now we have a kind of, if you can see, now we have a sort of macro idea of why this is so, um, and not acidification yet. Thank you.